why are we talking about the steel sector today? We think it's absolutely central to the trade and climate change debates and that the solutions that we need to form for the future uh, must take account of the steel sector's needs. You will see on the mural, which I'll talk about briefly, that uh, which we had commissioned, especially for the event today, that <laughs> steel on the top, uh, top right there is very important. It also makes ships, it makes renewable energy in terms of hydro, and uh, a lot of cement as well, another important sector. And then we just took a bit of artistic license and added some semi-naked people just to get a bit of attention. <laughs> but more seriously, what we find is that um, there are considerable benefits in drilling down into a particular sector and, and doing some detailed analysis. When uh, Ingrid introduced the session saying you know, we're talking about carbon and carbon leakage, we've also found that in, in our work, which we've been doing over the last three years under various projects and for, for various purposes, we found that, um, that the, the, the issues faced by these sectors are, are far wider than, than purely carbon policy. And we need to put that carbon policy within context into the other problems and issues that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Over those past three years, we've looked at sectoral approaches, the title of, of the presentation, which I'll, I'll mention to some extent. We looked at border carbon adjustment. We've looked at subsidies, which came up earlier. Um, from the presentation today, I will give some relatively high-level conclusions, not backed up by much analysis in this presentation. I hope, you know, if you if you look into our material and ask you about uh, ask us about that, then we will um, the, the conclusions we are drawing are hopefully robust from that. Ingrid asked me not to use any words on my slides, so there's there's mostly pictures, which is a, an interesting approach for such a technical sector. We will hopefully generate from this presentation some materials to inform the rest of the considerations today, and particularly for the last sector. Um, by going into detail into these sectors, we generate uh, hopefully some useful uh, conclusions. And then we're going to set out at the end uh, next steps for policy makers. I say we. I introduced my colleague as well, Lucy Kitson, who works with me as an economist uh, in the room today. And Aaron Cosby has been helping with this work too. So we had a, um, this is the Steel Making and Climate Change Challenge, um, as put together by Tata Steel, one of the world's largest companies. And they've got there the balance between growth, that small child there, hoping to double his size by 2050, and then the sustainability issue where we have an ambition to cut CO2 emissions significantly. Um, the, the example here is by at least 50% by 2050. So if we're doubling growth and halving the emissions per unit, that means you've got to reduce the actual emissions per unit of steel by a factor of four. Uh, that is obviously a serious amount. And... This, this slide was presented a couple of weeks ago. We held a presentation, a, a workshop called Deepening Understanding of Energy Intensive Industries in Brussels. Tata Steel and other companies made presentations. One of the key factors we found by looking uh, at our work over the last three years on steel and the other energy intensive sectors is that there is a continuous need to, to better educate policymakers about what the issues are facing these sectors and what their choices are and what their room for manoeuvre is and how much all of that might cost, and, and again, then, the legal issues. So some of the, the findings we've had from, from these various projects, what is the available mitigation from technologies and techniques uh, from the steel sector? First up, people, look, we, look, we look at four options. First up is there are some small, very inefficient, obsolete <coughs> plants. Uh, this is actually a picture of a, a, almost like a homemade smelter where you can make your own bullets if you wanted to do that sort of thing. And there is some emissions potential from the worldwide sector in closing down these small obsolete plants. Uh, some of those are in China, some are in India. It's, it's a one-off game, and a lot of the issues around it are social policy rather than necessarily climate. Uh, but it would, it would make some emissions reductions as a one-off gain in the shortish term. Next up is a picture. This is actually um, from China, but some time ago. There are various things you can do to make existing plants more efficient, but again, they're limited in their terms of, of scale, they're limited in the, in the amount of emissions reductions you might expect. So typically, uh, the, the processes that we look at in something like steel making or something like cement uh, making are, they've been optimized over a period of, of 100 years or more, and they're pretty efficient. There's not much you can do to continuously ramp down um, the emissions from those sectors. There are some small benefits that you can make at some of the, the poorer um, performing plants of today. Again, a bit of a one-off uh, benefit and not too high in extent. Something that's often brought up is what about more electric arc furnaces? So using, rather than using blast furnaces where you start with iron ore and coal, what about um, using electric arc furnaces which, which are typically about five times less per unit, um, five times less 
CO2 is produced per unit of uh, steel from an electric arc furnace than from a blast furnace, if we look at the whole sort of life cycle. But we're completely constrained there by the amount of scrap that there is available to feed those electric arc furnaces. And essentially, virtually all the scrap that is available is already used in the world um, uh, at the present time. Some of it is traded across borders. Uh, for instance, Turkey has a lot of uh, imports of scrap to, to feed its electric arc furnaces. But there isn't much extra quantity we could get by collecting more scrap. So that's not an option either. And then finally, we could all build nice uh, new shiny plants. And what we find is that the, the new plants that are going in across the world are basically state-of-the-art everywhere. There, there, it isn't the case that plants being built in Europe are significantly more efficient than plants being built in China or India or the US or Brazil or anywhere else. They're basically the same, and they're basically their um, performance environmentally is the same. So there isn't much of a benefit of by saying, why don't we make all the uh, new, new plants uh, to the same high standard? So from those four options, there is some mitigation potential of CO2, but it's pretty limited and it tends to be uh, one-off. Uh, next sort of conclusion, sort of dipping around a bit here, is we asked a question, is carbon changing trends? Uh, this is a picture of world steel production over the past 10 years. I've got one of these. Um, what we're looking at here on the, the axis is how much has production and demand changed since the year 2000 in 100 million tonnes of crude steel? Uh, this is one of my favourite graphs of the, the recent past, and you can see here that China has you know, taken almost all the extra demand and production over the past 10 years. The rest of the world completely combined did about half as much growth as China up to the, up to the crisis and then lost all that when it went back into the crisis. So China is completely dominating uh, this market. It's now responsible for about 50% of world steel, so what it does really matters. And I, you know, it, there's, there's almost no point in talking about whether the EU ETS has made any difference to um, this sort of uh, graph. EU ET, the EU is about 10% of world steel production and has some um, relations with China in terms of trade. But basically, there's, there's a huge country here uh, which is dominating the production. Carbon isn't changing things yet. We also looked in detail in uh, Austria and some interesting trade patterns there. Um, and very typical for a European country, very typical for even energy intensive industries, a lot of these countries are continuing, as they always have done, to trade with their near neighbours. This isn't, uh, the trade isn't sort of US to China, it's mostly Austria to Germany, Austria um, to Hungary, uh, Austria to, to the former Yugoslav states. We find investment is highly cyclical um, and it's based on cash flow. The steel sector at the, whoops, at the beginning of previews. The steel sector at the beginning of the, uh, the noughties, the 2000s, was uh, not in a good state. Prices were low. They were talking about um, reducing subsidies and reducing capacity. Then, as we got into 2006, 7, 8, huge boom in prices, boom in production. Everyone made a lot of money and they used some of that to invest in new plants. And then we came down again with the fiscal crisis. And what we, what we basically find there is, is two things. It's firstly that if you want to look at these sectors, you know, don't take a single year, take a whole economic cycle to look at them. And then secondly, uh, there always seems to be another, there's always, there's always something more current and more important to the industry than climate change at any given point in time. So at some point, the uh, steel sector at the moment is talking a lot about upstream pricing for raw materials. Um, a couple of years ago it was something else, a couple of years from now it'll be something else again. But the number one priority doesn't tend to be um, climate change. And we are producing a couple of papers at the moment called Policymakers Guides to these Energy Intensive Industries, uh, Relative Importance of Climate Change Policy in Carbon Dioxide. We're looking at steel and we're looking at cement. Um, on, the, on the graph here, we argue that it's long-term investment leakage which is the real concern rather than short-term. These are figures from um, Austria. We will note that if Austria were, were paying €30 Euros per tonne um, for its CO2 from its steel sector for all its emissions, that would take somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of its profit, EBITDA, um, over the, the past few years. But in act what it's actually paying is the, is the black and the black dotted lines at the bottom. If we look at the deficit that they've had or the surplus under the EU, and we multiply that by 15 or 30, we effectively see that there haven't really been any carbon, net carbon prices um, to that sector at the moment. But at some point in the future, if we start thinking about new technology, or we start thinking about charging these sectors the full price of the emissions, there will be some significant numbers. And how that's 
uh, some significant extra costs to the jurisdictions that apply those. And how that's likely to manifest itself is that we'll see uh, long-term investment decisions. This came very clearly out of our, our conference with, with industry um, in Brussels last month. That it's what, what they're saying is basically if there are strong carbon jurisdictions, we won't invest anymore, we won't build any more new plants there, we'll build them elsewhere. So it's the long-term investment leakage question that seems to us to be more interesting and more relevant than the short-term one. So if we can't do much with the existing technologies, what are the breakthrough technologies? Uh, the EC has a scheme called ULCOS, um, uh, lots of diagrams, and this, this pipe here is capturing the carbon because they want to put some CCS type technology as part of this breakthrough technology. Um, Japan has a scheme called Course 50 and a flowchart and all sorts of things you'll, you'll see. And I think what I really wanted to show from this graph is that most of this stuff is basically up, up on the drawing board. We're not talking about breakthrough technologies that are identified, that are commercially available, or, or, or something that we just need to throw money at. If these sectors are to significantly reduce their emissions, they need some brand new technologies which are probably at a very early research stage. Some of the things we could identify now might work and some might not. Uh, so there's a real challenge there. How could they actually get to a position where they could you know, reduce the emissions per tonne of steel by a factor of four or whatever might be needed? Uh, we would argue that resources are available for research, uh, development, dissemination and not deployment, whatever the other D is. Um, if we're just looking at research and development demonstration, we looked at the Course 50 and the ULCOS schemes. In, um, we compared that to, this is for the Japanese steel sector, we compared that to their profit, to their capital expenditure and to the tax revenue um, from those sectors. The first two um, periods of the Course 50, which is a collaborative Japanese scheme, would, compared to those, those, um, those figures, would take less than 1% of profit of capital expenditure of tax of the steel sector in Japan. So they could afford that, we would argue. It doesn't necessarily mean that that sector should pay for it. Maybe it should come from tax receipts or from uh, general government revenue, but uh, they can afford it. Similar sort of pattern with all costs. And we'd also, uh, we, 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 we said if there are four major steel companies in Japan, if all of those had a CCS demonstration scheme over the next 10 years and paid for it, how much would that relate to their um, profit, capital expenditure and tax receipts? And it's somewhere between 2 and 4%. So we would argue again that there, there is enough money to do demonstration and research and, and we need to get on with doing that demonstration and research if we're going to change uh, the prospects of these sectors on a climate basis. Um, on, on Japan as well, we've, we've done a lot of work in ISD on sectoral approaches. We've renamed them sectoral approaches, agreements and mechanisms because sectoral approaches now has negative connotations. It's seen as um, target setting by stealth by some countries. And we looked uh, at Japan, we looked at China, we looked at India. And basically on the sectoral approach, it seems the way forward is not, the, the, there's no um, momentum and there's no desire for international sectoral approaches with trading of allowances across borders. If there are going to be sectoral approaches, they're likely to be at national level, possibly at regional level. The most useful thing we could identify for Japan was a collaborative approach to technology development and implementation, basically asking the question, if, we, we, if you know, the, the Japanese sector is already high-tech, it's, it's a world leader there, if the premise is that the new technology must be developed and implemented as quickly as possible, what sort of sectoral approach needs to come in place? And we came up with, with a scheme that is basically a plan. It's based on existing initiatives. It's at a national level. It will need some more um, finance um, beyond the current level of money it's getting. There are various uh, possibilities of raising that finance. For instance, uh, they have a basic law there which includes some environment tax. And perhaps the targets would be best set, as far as industry is concerned, they say if, if we can show that we're actively contributing as much as we can in terms of effort, in terms of willingness, in terms of finance, that should be the measure that's um, of, of success of this collaborative scheme, not necessarily outputs, because outputs are highly uncertain. So, to wrap up, what does this, this take us to, the options and needs? We think that 2030 is the right sort of timescale to be thinking about this, the medium term. Um, a lot of policies have already been set for the next few years, and investment cycles and, and project, product development and investments do take uh, quite some time. First up is the importance of um, collaborative research and development schemes. All costs is the European one, and that should be continued and, and built on. Question again, how, how quickly and how much can we spend on research and development, and how can we organise such that it's most effective? 
Uh, that is a rather poor clip art that's meant to depict the carbon market. How much could we rely on carbon pricing? All our work has showed that um, carbon pricing alone is probably not going to be sufficient to stimulate new technology development and new investment at the scale that's needed. So how do we come up with a suite of policies that includes both carbon, policy, uh, carbon pricing at, at whatever level and <coughs> other complementary policies? A lot of talk in steel from the World Steel Association and from some of the manufacturers about needing a whole life cycle approach to properly um, uh, take account of the value chain of the supply chain. What's needed there really is, is some practical mechanisms that actually turn that into something that's implementable. It's easy to say we need a value chain approach <coughs> based on the supply cycle and we should bring in upstream and downstream and whatever. How do you actually do that in practice is the key question, but it's something that's worth exploring because, uh, one reason, because the industry is interested in it itself. What about forums? Uh, Daniel Pete in his presentation earlier mentioned you know, fora other than the WTO, perhaps other than the UNFCCC. And if we look at forums that could take, you know, that could have mature and um, well-informed conversations about sectors such as steel, uh, the, the one that comes to mind is the OECD Steel Committee, um, which has um, <coughs> very good representation and includes all the major non-OECD players come along. It's very well managed. They, based on trade uh, particularly, is, is their issue, trade and subsidi subsidies and dumping <coughs> and so on. But perhaps the environment angles could also be brought into that committee's considerations. Uh, we haven't seen, you know, there seems very little possibility <coughs> that the UNFCCC would be able to have such a conversation. They haven't been able to have any detailed uh, conversations about specific sectors as yet. Uh, perhaps you, you could say that red or agriculture is moving in that direction, but from the industrial sectors, uh, nothing much has happened on that. Um, that's a picture of aluminium, which isn't really covered by the steel sector. Um, just to point out that some of these competitiveness <coughs> leakage issues are already uh, current. The EU producers of non-ferrous metals are saying that because the Electricity price in the EU has gone up so significantly because of pass-through of carbon costs from the electricity sector. They're already feeling the pain of, um, electric, of um, <coughs> essentially carbon policy, and therefore they are already subject to competitiveness and leakage. What needs to be done now? And there's a big sort of state aid debate that will <coughs> come up um, next year within the EC and how various countries will decide whether or not to compensate some of their non-ferrous metal sectors for um, the extra cost of electricity of electricity, and that is covered by the EU ETS. Finally, um, something that will come out, I think, through the rest of the session today, what about standards and labels? If, we, if we're not going to think only about um, border carbon adjustments or about carbon taxes, how about a made-in-the-EU steel standard um, or a label that somebody could put, up, put together? Uh, our work in Austria showed that that was, you know, perhaps had some um, uh, interest, those things, of course, could be done as private standards as well and, and sort of get past some of the WTO rules on that basis. And those things would be highly protectionist and would be um, uh, obviously subject to quite strong um, political and perhaps even legal challenges. So I think lots, lots to do on this issue. Um, very interesting. I think um, we'll, we'll keep working on these sectors because they really, by drilling into one particular sector, you really get into some interesting debates. And... I, I leave you there with some, some thoughts, hopefully, for the rest of the day about some of the things we, we could be thinking about in terms of research and policy uh, for the future. Thank you.